Getting people to like or even understand your hobby can be a difficult task if you're into motorsport, especially endurance racing. While we enthusiasts love talking about obscure and iconic race cars, discuss strategies and watching high-octane wheel-to-wheel action, there's still quite a lot of people who have no idea who this guy is, what this thing is, or what is even going on here. And unlike Formula 1, which saw a monumental spike in popularity thanks to the Drive to Survive Netflix series, endurance racing is in comparison to F1 still quite a niche motorsport. Luckily, with this new golden age of LMDH and hypercars in IMSA and WEC, endurance racing is growing at a rapid pace in terms of popularity. Word of mouth amongst car and racing enthusiasts is making more and more people start to take interest into our beloved sport. Having massive and historically significant brands like Ferrari and Porsche on board helps a lot too, of course. But what can really help is getting the mainstream entertainment business to make a movie about it. And that's the topic of this video. You ready? I was born ready, Mr. Shelby. Hit it. While there are a vast amount of car and racing movies out there, the majority of them focus on car chases and street racing. But movies where the main topic is a real motorsport series, even if the story is fictional or not, are a lot more rare. But at the very least, there does seem to be one movie made for almost every major type of motorsport. NASCAR has Days of Thunder and Talladega Nights, American Open Wheel Racing has Driven, Formula 1 has Grand Prix and Rush, and endurance racing fans aren't left out either, as they arguably have some of the best racing movies to watch, like Steve McQueen's Le Mans and Ford vs Ferrari. If you want to know what the Ford vs Ferrari movie alone did for the popularity of the sport and its drivers, just look at the Google Trends charts of Ken Miles, one of the main characters of the movie. Before November of 2019 he almost didn't exist, but after the movie released he turned into a superstar. It's the same with the cars too, as people obviously got a lot more interested in the Ford GT40 when the movie released. But while the general audience is there to enjoy movies like it because of their stories, Racing enthusiasts and just hardcore race car nerds like me can also enjoy these movies in a different kind of way, by spotting all the cars and filming locations like some sort of easter egg hunt. For example, in this scene from Ford vs Ferrari, we see a Ferrari 250 GTO crashing violently right after driving under the iconic Dunlop Bridge at Le Mans. Motorsport fans alike will recognize this piece of road as the backstretch at Road Atlanta, but ran in the opposite direction. Since Le Mans now looks quite different than Le Mans of the 60s, the movie makers obviously had to look for different locations and then transform the background into somewhat looking like the French countryside. The Daytona 24 hour scenes also stand out for motorsport fans as they instantly see that the banking isn't nearly as steep enough and the corners don't match up at all. That's because in reality they filmed at Auto Club Speedway in California. But this is all very understandable, as both Auto Club Speedway and Road Atlanta still somewhat look like old school racetracks. Not a lot of CGI work is needed to make the backgrounds look old, something you would have to do if you were to film at Daytona or Le Mans, since they have massive grandstands and fancy modern buildings all over the place. It's for the same reason why pretty much nothing was filmed on location in Le Mans and they just built an almost exact replica of the start line on an airstrip, again in California. That other modern racing movie set in the past, Rush, also does the same tricks. The famous scene where Lada gives his honest opinion on the Ferrari after test driving it on the Fiorano test track wasn't filmed at Fiorano, but Brands Hatch, specifically the pit entrance. Brands Hatch and other British tracks like Cadwell Park and Donington ended up being used to pose as all sorts of tracks like Fuji Speedway, Monza, Paul Ricard and the Nürburgring, even though the real Nürburgring was used for some scenes. Another way of tricking the audience is by inserting footage of the actual real races into the film. Movies set in the past can't really do this often, seeing as the camera quality is obviously not the same as modern cameras, so it's the movie set in present day that can profit off this the most. The infamous movie Driven, starring Sylvester Stallone, has an obvious example of this. That's because in the real footage we can see the top class Reinhardt and Lola cars of the car championship, while in the close-up shots filmed in a different location, the cars magically become a little bit smaller, because they used lower class indie lights in Formula Atlantic cars for these scenes. Using different cars for filming purposes isn't anything new. Lots of cars used in the 1966 Grand Prix film weren't real F1 cars, but rather Formula 3 cars with big Formula 1 tires stuck onto them. As with Driven, lots of real life racing footage was mixed in as well, and because the helmets of the fictional characters were painted to look like the helmets of real life F1 racers, the real footage didn't stand out all that much compared to the fake footage. But compared to these open wheel movies, the 24 hours of Le Mans movies do end up using quite a lot of real top class race cars. 
Steve McQueen's Le Mans from 1971 famously uses real Porsche 917s, Ferrari 512s and a lot more for its filming sequences. Some Porsches were graciously provided by Porsche themselves, but when Enzo Ferrari read the script of the movie, revealing that a Porsche would win, he refused to provide any cars for the film, so instead, privately owned Ferraris had to be used. But the filmmakers really profited of the fact that they were allowed to film during the actual 1970 race, and to step it up a notch, they entered the car in the race itself too. The number 29 Porsche 908 driven by Porsche factory driver Herbert Linge and Jonathan Williams was fitted with three heavy cameras to capture as much footage as possible during the race. This did have a negative effect on the performance of the car and basically ruined the aerodynamics. Furthermore, the car had to do frequent pit stops to change out the film reels. This also meant that in the end it wasn't qualified, as it failed to reach the minimum race distance. Still, because so many cars were tired, the car unofficially finished the race in an impressive 8th place overall. More filming was done after the race as the company rented the track for several weeks. Plenty of time to film lots of the fancy close-up shots and actors inside the cars. As for the tracking shots, some unique camera cars had to be used. Not a fan of simply speeding up footage, McQueen had all the cars drive at quite a high pace, so he needed a car that could keep up with it. The answer? A Mark 1 Ford GT40. As of today, real Ford GT40s could fetch millions at an auction, but back then they were seen as old-gen race cars that aren't competitive anymore. So nobody really objected to cutting the roof of one and putting a camera on it. Lola T70s were also more common and less rare than the Porsches and Ferraris, so that's why they dressed up several Lolas to look like Ferraris to then smash them to pieces. The gratuitous destruction of real race cars did end up inflating the budget of the movie and in the end they spent 1.5 million dollars more than they initially planned to. While the movie features some amazing driving sequences, it did end up being a commercial failure, losing millions at the box office. It would take a whopping 31 years for another movie to be made featuring the 24 hours of Le Mans, the in 2003 released French made movie called Michel Vaillant, based on the famous comic book series of the same name. The fictional character of Michel Vaillant is a bit of a motorsport hero in France. Ever since Jean Graton created the character in 1959, Michel has been featured in dozens of comics featuring all sorts of motorsports. In 2003, a movie was made about him, the fictional Vaillant brand and their attempt at winning the 24 hours of Le Mans. Just like Steve McQueen's Le Mans, the cinematography of this movie is almost unrivaled. Luc Besson, famous for giving us some of the best car chases in the taxi and transporter movies, was responsible for the screenplay. But instead of working with four-door saloons, this time he got to work with a wide variety of real race cars including, at the time, the highest level of Le Mans prototypes. Whoever was in charge of sourcing and somewhat casting cars for this movie should receive some sort of medal. Next to a Pagani Zonda, Peugeot, Renault and Subaru rally cars, Shelby Cobra and a purpose-built car for the movie, the Vaillant Grand Défi, the main two stars of the movie are the LMP cars. On one side we have the good guys, the Vaillant team and their sleek and unoffensive looking Lola B9810. While on the other side of the spectrum we have the arch rivals of the Vaillant team, the leaders. In the comic books they always used bright red cars and often unfair tactics to try and beat the Vaillants. So what the movie needed was an aggressive looking car that could match with the bad guy vibes of the leader team. And they got it thanks to the Palmos LMP1 Roadster S, the perfect car for the job. Lots of footage used in the film comes from the real 2002 24 hours of Le Mans. And again cars were entered by the movie company in the race with the sole purpose of generating some footage. The French Dumps team, currently active in Formula 2, were in charge of running one Lola and one Panos in the race. In the movie there are two cars per team, so for the real cars a neat trick was used. The left side had different driver names on it compared to the right side. The same method was used in World War II airplane movies where different nose art was painted on each side of the fuselage to make it look like they had more planes. The movie does feature its fair share of unrealistic and unbelievable scenes that would cause an instant red flag situation, but it is supposed to be a comic book movie after all. It is worth mentioning that the overwhelming majority of the movie scenes were all filmed practically, resulting in some glorious cinematography. Yes, they did crash, jump, race and drift these cars for real. You wanna see two LMP cars blasting down a French highway in the rain? You're only gonna see it here. With Brad Pitt making a movie about Formula 1 and the Gran Turismo movie not that far off from its theatrical release, it seems like motorsport fans around the world will have a new opportunity to drag friends and family along to the theater and try and get them into their favorite hobby once again. In my opinion, the Gran Turismo movie looks pretty interesting, and it looks like director Neil Blomkamp used all the tricks in the book. 
Here we see the Hungaro ring pretending to be Le Mans, and there looks to be plenty of real race cars in it. And some oddball cars too, that aren't actually race cars, but rather dedicated track toys, like the Ford GT Mark II seen here, and the Ligier JSPX, which appears to be the main hero car. If you've enjoyed any of these motorsport movies, the next thing you should do is check out the countless of excellent racing documentaries you can find right here on YouTube. Some of which featuring Hollywood stars like Jason Statham narrating Truth in 24 and Michael Fassbender's journey to becoming a racing driver in the excellent Road to Le Mans series. IMSA and WEX coverage has been brought up to the next level as well, with IMSA's Win the Weekend and WEX full access providing a behind the scenes look at both racing series. Hollywood may know how to put on a show, but when it comes to car racing, fiction pretty much always gets beaten by reality. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to like it and subscribe if you don't want to miss out on the next one.